Today, it's an absolute privilege to be joined by Srijit Mukherjee, co-founder and chief development officer at Infabrica. Welcome, Srijit. Nice to be here. Absolutely. So, um, Srijit has led a storied career and is a pioneer of multiple transformative technologies, including several firsts. Um, in a prior conversation with me, he joked that he's enjoyed working on technologies before many of them even had a name, an official name like GP or Smartnik. Um, yet his greatest impact extends far beyond these milestones. He's made an indelible mark on modern networking, shaping the philosophies and technologies that underpin today's network architecture. During his tenure as VP of Engineering at Cumulus Networks, he was at the forefront of the open networking revolution was the key architect and director of engineering for Nuova's, uh, which is now Cisco's SmartNIC-based server system, and currently holds a position on the Linux Net Dev Conference Society Board of Directors. Srijit's path first crossed with Roshan during uh, his time at Cumulus, and the two found they shared a similar perspective. He and Roshan reunited in 2020 and founded in Fabrica with a shared vision for the future of networking. They spent the first years developing the foundation of their technology and having discussions with potential customers before emerging from stealth earlier this year. He's also an avid sportsman and has accumulated and passed on countless leadership lessons from two of his greatest passions, soccer and the martial arts. Shujit, did I miss anything? No, I think that's pretty, pretty complete. I'm uh, blushing a little bit in case you can't tell. Uh... Well, welcome again, and uh, without further ado, I, I want to delve right in because I, I know that I am, I'm sure the audience is uh, excited to, to hear from you and how I'd like to kick these things off. It's my favorite question to ask technologists at heart, um, engineers at heart, who later became executives and, and founders like yourself. What originally got you into engineering? Uh, it's a funny question. I, uh, I've always been very curious about how things work. And when I was very young, I uh, realized that the best way to understand how things work was to actually build it. Uh, for example, I wanted to learn how a plane flies, and I decided the right way to do it is to try to build a plane uh, from the ground up. Needless to say, the plane didn't fly, but I learned a lot about how, how flight happens. So that, that eventually culminated in what I'm doing these days. Awesome. And what you're doing these, these days, we'll, we'll get to. Um, but can you walk us through your, your career journey and highlight the pivotal decisions or, or, or revelations that ultimately led to your current role as uh, CDO, Chief Development Officer of Infabrica? Sure, um, I would say uh, it's a bit non-standard, right? I've, I have always uh, focused on a couple of very important questions. Is, this, is, a, is a company, an organization, a set of people, are they working on something that's going to actually change state of the art, status quo. If it is, is this something that I can be a part of? Do I bring something to the table or can I learn how to bring something to the table here and does it speak to me? And if those two are true, then the most important question, is there a set of people here who have a crisp vision and an ability to lead a path or show a path to that vision that I can follow? If those three things have been true, it's a thing I've always followed and, and signed up for. Um, this is why I joined SGI when SGI was trying to build this uh, floating point frame buffer, a thing that today is now called a GPU. I joined Cisco's, or that was Nova's team at the time, because they were building something that was going to revolutionize the virtualized server. Um, I did open networking because I thought it was absolutely the right way to go. And in all cases, there were leaders who were very visionary, who were masters of their craft, and from whom I learned practically for free. You could, you could uh, ask the question, was it economically valid? Was it the right thing to do? Was it a good career step? I found that optimizing for those things don't actually work out in the long run. It's much more what value you bring to the table that matters. Absolutely. Um, now, in Fabrica is one of the key companies we believe will be a winner in the AI machine learning accelerated compute space mm -hmm. where networking is absolutely integral. Um, what made you and Roshan decide to be all in in this sector? Um, it's funny. Uh, 
you know, when we started, AI and ML wasn't as hot a topic as it is today. And Fabrica was started on the premise that the interconnects of the world had fractured, right? The, there was this world of CXL, UPI, uh, Axie, pick your favorite uh, CPU to CPU interconnect. And then there were the network fabric people that were trying to build bigger and larger enterprise systems with more robustness, more automation, more of everything. And uh, the, the fundamental issue was that the AI applications, or not issue, the fundamental value here was AI applications had also evolved. Unlike the previous attempts like HPC or enterprise networking, people didn't want the network to be invisible. They actually wanted to be able to benefit from the capability and the capacity to be able to scale out and add more compute to the story. So when we started, we said what we start, we surveyed the field and looked at what was missing that prevented these two universes to combine. How could you build a component, a device that allowed you to make bigger computers, but also interconnect them as much as you need? And it turns out AI and ML were the perfect customer. The people were looking for that solution, and we happened to be a, a, a component or a design that applies. Makes a lot of sense. And in a prior conversation, you shared with me about the significant phase changes in networking from legacy enterprise monolithic infrastructure to distributed computing and cloud. With, with your experience and insight, what do you envision is the future of networked computing? So it's, uh, yeah, so like if you look at the history of computing, right, the evolution was, you know, faster and faster CPUs, then servers with larger and larger CPUs and proprietary interconnects, the rise of NUMA, the rise of big cache coherent buses, and then the rise of Cisco and enterprise computing, which was bigger than one box or bigger than the biggest box you could build. What was the next step? CSPs or hyperscalers that were building rather than the Cisco style proprietary solutions built on standard interfaces. Now, completely disaggregated solutions built on standard components, standard interfaces, and all the intelligence was in how you stitch them together. When you come to ML, sort of the, the, the coin has flipped a little bit. Now you're back to building mainframe style, big systems with proprietary interconnects and proprietary scaling patterns. So what has to happen next is all of these streams will merge, right? They will have to merge, it is inevitable. And what I mean by that is you're going to have to build systems that can do high performance scaling and classical network uh, sort of sprawl, if you will, and be able to transparently migrate between the two in a, in a simple way. If you don't achieve this goal, then you will end up with a divergent path that will never ever come to that. Okay. Well, you have a thorough understanding of the, of the market and, and it's impressive and inspiring. Can you share the specific challenges you discovered that your future customers needed solving and what you what gave you the confidence that Infabrica was well positioned to address them? Yeah, this is a this one's a little bit of an interesting question, right? So again, if you go back to where the world had evolved to enterprise networking and, and actually for that matter even hyperscaler networking which had really focused on how do i take a bunch of customers who are asking for relatively low performance aggregate them up and create a high performance system right so if you look at most of these large even large enterprises today you're talking about systems that have hundreds of thousands to millions of endpoints but each of them consuming somewhere in the order of a gigabit to 10 gigabits, maybe 40 gigabits for small bursts of time. And then you have this opposite end of the spectrum, these high performance ML clusters today that are talking, they don't even count in gigabits, they count in gigabytes per second, right? Your sort of your entry token is 100 gigabytes per second. And the question that comes up is, are you forever now bound to building these systems as completely independent systems that sometimes have some shared attributes or shared resources. Clearly, that's not a good way to build a large scale 
system with a, a large scale company with a lot of these uh, systems that exist. So the place where we found uh, the challenges or the specific thing that we address and where we've seen the most groundswell is being able to come in with a system architecture and a vision that says, no, you don't have to think of them as completely independent things. Here is a component that fits into a system architecture that allows you to think of systems as either very high performance small clusters or a large collection of relatively lower performance clusters, but built around a same unifying fabric and a same unifying platform. The rest becomes a software choice. This is something that almost everybody we speak to resonates. Well, and I can see why. And at last count, there are over 195 companies uh, in the AI machine learning hardware and accelerated compute space. Um, in such a very crowded space, what sets in Fabrica apart and how do you intend to leverage the differentiation in this growing market? Yeah, so the general aspect that people have looked at when you talk about ML hardware is twofold. There are people building processors that are going to be more efficient, will do more matrix multiplies, will do it at half power and so on and so forth. And then there are people who are building wider fabrics, people who say that I will give you the best networking, the highest bandwidth, the lowest uh, dollar per byte that you could, uh, you could get to connect these systems up. But what's been missing has invariably been the glue, the thing that says, how does compute elements, how do compute elements that have to scale up and then scale out talk to each other? And if you think of them as two independent factions, you end up with a design that sort of moves together in a very lopsided manner. Sometimes the compute is so far ahead of networking, sometimes the networking is so far ahead of compute that the two do not kind of combine. A, a case in point today, right? You look at uh, the switching universe and you get 800 gig ports just out the bat. You look at the compute universe and you see that compute elements are very, very uh, constrained, are incapable of consuming more than 400 gigabits and not even 400 gigabits per thread, per stream. So if you think about how do these two worlds have to, how the worlds have to combine and how do you build a system that is coherent, you need a device like what we are building. So the good news for us is we think we are uh, partners, collaborators with pretty much anybody who's building mm. anything in the world of machine learning. And conversely, we believe we are a, an integral component that you need to be able to achieve an elastic performance profile. Thanks for that explanation. And could you share the most exciting market response you've received to date? Yeah, so uh, as you have noted earlier, right, we are a solution that applies to both the scale up and the scale out domains. And what that means, what does scale up mean today, right? Today it means either these proprietary buses we talked about before, but there's also this rather exciting new uh, innovation along the lines of CXL, Compute Express Link, which is a, an interface that allows CPU to expose their internal communications to the outside world. And then there is, on the other side, the scale out universe of Ethernet, Rocky, TCP, RDMA, and a few other words in the buzzword bingo that allows you to create these uh, relatively higher latency but longer reach communication uh, models. We are one of the most, in this world, we are pretty unique that we sit on both of those uh, universes. And one of the things that we bring to the table is an ability to translate between these scale up and scale out domains without requiring any additional components. And mm -hmm. in fact, offload some of the communication overload or overheads onto ourselves. Um, so the, the, the fundamental thing that we've seen from customers that uh, resonates with our perspective is they have to solve both. And most solutions today solve one or the other because people have been hyper specialized in the widgets that they have built in the past. So the first thing that we hear, which is very um, heartwarming is you're right. We have to solve both those problems. And we were going to look at them serially. But then when we realized that when we are talking about 800 gig networking, we are talking about speeds and bandwidths. That's more than my DRAM's capacity to, to, uh, to fulfill. 
I realized that I can't actually consider them as piecemeal stories because if I solve one, it will be very hard to come back and address the other. The other things we've shown, I think you've seen some of the demos that uh, we've shown at the AI Hardware Summit and at other similar conferences. A, a statement we've heard a lot is, you know, Ethernet is not good for doing 800 gig networking and uh, CPUs can't keep up with packet processing rates and so on and so forth. And we've demonstrated multiple times that we can do 800 gig even over TCP and do things like GPU direct such that we can build components that provide and deliver super high performance and very exacting requirements on standard technologies. And lastly, the thing that we are also doing that is a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say cutting edge, but it's very important and required for the class of solutions we are targeting is the ability to inject memory into the network. Today, most of memory, while there's a lot of no, uh, uh, excitement, I should say, about CXL and how to get to memory through remote access mechanisms, the access methods are still tied to CPUs and, and compute elements. One of the things we are doing is by making the memory show up on the network, you can position it in a place where you can aggregate it, you can distribute it, you can exercise and execute patterns where it makes sense for the memory to be at the stage that it is in for the application that you're trying to target. Uh, we can go into that in greater detail later if needed, but uh, it's actually a very exciting and uh, I think a very long road of uh, innovation that we are embarking on. Absolutely, and your solution also, I'm sure is refreshing because it doesn't require your customers to build a $500 million data center around it, nor does it require them to, um, create friction with their current customers and changing software. Uh, exactly, actually that's one of the things, uh, one thing I have really learned over the years is that software interfaces and software ecosystems are typically the hardest thing to change uh -huh. because there's a lot of, not because it's complex or it's complicated or it's poorly written or anything like that. But what happens with software is that you end up building uh, it in layers. And if you're doing something at the lowest layer, invariably it means many layers above you have to change to be able to incorporate that, that uh, slightly improved technology. So one of the things we've actually spent a lot of effort on in this, in this company is making sure we are well staffed on the software side from day zero, on the architecture side and on the implementation side, so that we pay an inordinate amount of uh, attention to how much tax we are going to introduce onto the software ecosystems that need to run on top of us. And uh, I believe we've done a, a pretty good job and we think we will be a fairly, as you exactly as you said, a fairly simple or low ripple insertion into existing ecosystems, which was a design goal from day zero. Absolutely, and considering the, the rapidly evolving landscape of AI transformer models, where do you see the most significant or fastest growth occurring within the AI ML sector in the next 12 to 18 months? Um, I think uh, given, as you said, the rapid evolution, I think it'll be very hard to actually make good predictions given uh, how, um, I guess there were a few people who predicted it, but in general, most people were caught by surprise by the wave or the, or the size of the wave. But there's a few things that I think are actually uh, in controversial. One is that the cost of compute at scale has got to change, right? The current design, which looks more like mainframes of yesteryears, is, uh, you know, it's, it's a well-crafted design. It delivers exactly the requirement that you need, but it does only that. Sharing it is hard. Everything is stuck at max performance. If you can't maximize its utilization, it's, it's a loss. And it's not the way, for example, it's not the way cloud systems are built today. And if you were to compare a cloud system and, a, and an ML system of, of 2023, you will see that the design principles are extremely divergent. So I think uh, what, as I said, is incontroversial is that the cost model is going to have to become more like the cloud model because uh, otherwise it becomes untenable. And what that means is components become something you select and software glues it together or stitches it together 
and the sharing and load uh, balancing and uh, sharding strategy that you get to execute will be something that is defined by the operator, not by the way the system is built. Um, the other thing I think is compute itself has got to get more cost efficient because again, the cost and power implications of current systems are generally untenable for most people other than the very deep pocketed institutions. And the third is I think memory demands will continue to rise. It already has risen quite a few fold. And if you look at the memory growth curves, they are also actually a bit out of control. Um, and it also means that the old model that just put memory everywhere and replicate and duplicate it because the cost of memory is not that high is going to itself have to change. And uh, it, it'll have to show up in different locations in the architecture as time goes on. Got it. You, you, you mentioned something about power there, and that's a, a great segue because there's various perspectives surrounding the, the topics of resource consumption and efficiency in terms of ensuring responsible AI. What impact do you anticipate and Fabric Solution will have in this regard, assuming success? Again, a dif difficult thing to, uh, to predict. Uh, by the way, it's, your question is obviously extremely important, and it's often a secondary aspect, right? Like if you go have a bunch of conversations around ML. Very rarely is power the first thing that people talk about. It's typically far more focused on flops and capacity and HBM size and, and things like that. But obviously the, the power and cooling issues and the bills that people are uh, signing off on today for uh, running ML will uh, come home to roost someday. And the solution, again, like I said, will have to look more like the cloud solution, right? Where you're basically saying, instead of building non-shared mainframe style systems, I'm going to build this massively shared infrastructure on which I'm going to overlay applications. And some applications will get to run at full speed, some applications will get to run at half speed, and I, the operator, get to decide how much I want to dial the power and uh, cooling bill up or down based on what I can sustain and what I can afford. Um, so. For, like I think the first part of that story is to build solutions and build systems that can be disaggregated and, and partitioned up. The next step is to make every component significantly more efficient. And uh, we expect to be first class partners in the solutions that emerge in that space, but I think it's going to take the whole village to make it better. Yeah, absolutely. And continuing on the, the vein of responsible AI, as, as a leader in the field, I, I know you're aware of the increasingly loud detractors who voice their opposition to AI, ML, citing concerns about the power of the technologies and their potentially destructive implications. What safeguards do you feel um, are necessary to ensure AI and machine learning is harnessed for constructive purposes? So interestingly enough, infrastructure doesn't have a lot to say about this because the only thing infrastructure can support or supply in this context is how do I use encryption and crypto technologies to make sure data doesn't become visible to each other, which is a little bit different from the general concern around ML predicting uh, the end of the world or, or taking over tasks that are uh, that were safeguarded by human control in the past. So I I don't really have much of an opinion in this space. Um, but I do think that, uh, like every other new technology, rushing headlong into sort of consigning all tasks to an ML infrastructure too soon is probably a thing you have to be careful about. Having said that, there are actually clearly uh, spaces like uh, safety, like simulation, like drug discovery, where uh, the the growth of ML is should be a welcome change, and and it will definitely speed up the rate at which we will find patterns in a sea of data that we've been able to find in the past. Absolutely, and I, I'd like to to shift gears a little bit away from um, the the technical elements because you're an esteemed leader and. Building a company involves identifying talented contribute, uh, contributors 
who can make an immediate impact and also demonstrate the potential to grow over time. What qualities and vectors of potential growth do you look for in, in engineers and how do you identify them? Yeah, so I, I have to say I might have a slightly uh, non-standard perspective here. Uh, I value attitude over everything else. And attitude is twofold. One is the attitude that I can solve a problem, that I can always teach myself how to solve a problem if I'm faced with it. But the second aspect of that attitude is that we are, I am a part of a team. Like if you think about team sports, uh, you'll see, right? Every team has stars and most teams have stars and extreme talents. But the enduring franchises, the ones that you know win cups year over year and, and become create dynasties, typically while they have superstars, also have highly functioning teams. There are very few repeat success organizations that have dysfunctional teams and just a star that keeps pulling them out of the hole every time. Uh. And if you're a star, you've got to understand that, that your team has to support you and you have to be part of that team. Otherwise, it's not going to work out. Um, so, and, and if you look at superlative teams, teams that can incorporate these stars and still be highly functional, they are built around a shared view of the task and, the, and a view that while each individual has to be able to carry their weight in a very, very efficient and effective way, they always have to have a little bit of capacity to take on somebody else's weight and carry it for a certain amount of time. Because, you know, we are a startup. And by definition, a startup is, is a universe of unknowns. And you need people who are comfortable with that unknown and comfortable enough in their own ability that they can not only deal with the unknown for themselves, but for their team at large. You bring these in, and then you will have you have a team that can do anything. Inspiring, um, Shuji. As you prepare to take in Fabrica to the next phase of growth, what are the the key concerns currently on your mind regarding team expansion, and what strategies do you plan to implement to address them? Yeah, the key the key concern. Uh, if you're in a startup, right, the first concern is always, are we building something that makes sense? The second concern is, okay, it sounds like we're building something that makes sense. Can we find the people who need, who we need to build it? Um, we've, we are past those two. Our concern is uh, probably the next one. And what is that? So startups, you know, like most startups, not always, but most of them, they exist because they want to change the world. But it turns out changing the world takes patience. And the phase we are in, patience is the hardest thing because everybody who's here has, has bought into the view, they've done the work, they think most, most questions have been answered, you're charging down the path to a product, but things have to fit in place. Customers have to accept things, boxes have to be built, so on and so forth. There's a whole litany of tasks that need to be done before you can say, I'm ready to change the world or the world is ready for change. And invariably at this time, uh, that patience and lack of patience, which can convert into fatigue and despair, are the hardest things to manage. Um, and, and the only thing, the only, and, and then of course, there's the increasing workload, which typically is mitigated by hiring more people. So you need a funnel of people who are going to come in and be net positive, not uh -huh. create disruption and create more work. And uh, you, have the, you have the people who are already in the trenches who've been fighting the trench war for a while to keep fighting. And that's hard. Um, the only uh, strategy I know of is to make sure that, uh, you know, you communicate and you over communicate and you over communicate some more. And you make sure that everybody who's in the fight understands what the stakes are, who's playing, who's not playing. They get a, a ringside view of, of how things are working out. Because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, one of the assets for every employee that they need to walk away from, walk away with, is I know how this works. I understand the birth of a new technology or I understand the birth of a new company. 
and uh, and it's hard, you know, because it's uh, it's also taxing on their families, it's taxing on personal life, it's taxing on on uh, work-life balance. So the prize has to be uh, commensurate, and the prize that is actually true here is being a part, being a foundational part of a new technology that the world will adopt. And that's the only thing I got that I can offer. Wow, that's more than a lot because the empathy to understand what what they will be giving up and sacrificing um, shows you truly care. Um, as a startup grows, there's always the potential for the egos of ambitious people to enter into the culture. Um, how do you effectively channel ambition to creative, constructive outcomes? And additionally, how do you proactively nurture a culture of cooperation and minimize egotism out in Fabrica? Yeah, so uh, this, this, by the way, is extremely difficult, right? And I think uh, I would say I have uh, well, but mostly successful track record on that. Um, the, the, it's, it's difficult, right? Because you want free thinkers. You want people who are going to push the envelope, push the boundaries, uh, who can think for themselves and, and have confidence in their thought. At the same time, you want a team that is you know, easy to manage, it's e easy to make them work with each other, make them march to the same instruction and to the same order. And it, and it's a tension, right? Because on the one hand, you want to be innovative and you want to be really on the cutting edge. On the other hand, you want to have high efficiency and, and be a disciplined delivery organization. Um, the only, again, the only strategy I know of that works there is you have to find the fairly small, very narrow and very rare set of people who are high performers, but understand how to work with each other and, and the concept of a team that I was talking about earlier. And the way you do, the, then if you can find those people, the way you solve that problem is you say, okay, I'm going to build my initial core around people like that. With those people, you create a culture. Once you have a culture, then other people come in and, and see that this team-oriented approach is the culture of the, of the organization. And then it becomes self-fulfilling and, and sort of self-propelling to some extent. But it's, it's a hard thing to do. And sometimes it means that your hiring cycles are longer. Sometimes it means you are rejecting uh, choices which may be perfect on paper, or may be perfectly the person that you were looking for, but you think that the chemistry and the dynamics won't work out. But if you can pull that off, you have an enduring team and an enduring culture, then it's sort of everything pays for itself. Absolutely, and you create a virtuous cycle then, um, rather than a vicious one. <laughs> um, what are the biggest recruiting challenges that you've uh, encountered in attracting in Fabrica to date, and what? How are you guys going about solving those? Um, I'm, I'm smiling, laughing because uh, we started in COVID. I used to say in the middle of COVID, but I'm not sure I know where the middle is anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, I, first and foremost, our challenge to recruiting has been COVID, which we sort of converted into a strength. We 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 embraced it. And uh, and Rochan was very insistent that we will convert this into a chance to hire the best talent we can find anywhere in the world, mm. which which has resulted in a few additional uh, uh, challenges because managing and getting a geographically disparate team has its own mm -hmm. uh, issues. But I think we've actually done very well there, and we now have multiple, uh, let's say, loci of, uh, of, uh, of engineers in multiple time zones. And it gives us some interesting attributes like uh, uh, full day coverage when we have expensive equipment to use because we can tell people, hey, go, you use the first 12 hours and then go to sleep. And those people will use the next 12 hours because they happen to be awake. Um, but it has been a bit of a challenge. The other thing that's happened is the economic uh, both up and down swings that we have experienced in the last couple of years has, has made it such that 
startups have become way more risky than it was, say, five to six years ago. So those two things have combined in rather interesting ways, but it has also forced us on the upside, it has forced us to rethink what is important. We've had to retool and recalibrate everything about how we hire, to how we allocate resources, to how we uh, provide compute capacity to our engineers, because if you are putting a server in your server room, and you know a significant portion of your engineers are going to be 12 hours away and very high latency and a very high latency link away it may not be the most optimal use of their time so it might be better that you move the server to the cloud and give them equidistant access and then let cloud providers solve half of your problem for you so it's it's been a let's say an ongoing set of challenges in that uh, in that space but um, the single largest one, I would say, is the complexity around silicon startups in, in today's world, because there aren't that many, which is, again, a blessing and a curse. It's been mm -hmm. very uh, good to us from the perspective of being able to hire the people we want to hire, because there weren't many other startups fighting with us. But it's also the fact that the, the economic climate has made it such that people are a lot more, more risk averse. Thanks for sharing that. And how are you today going about solving those problems um, with recruiting top talent? Um, slowly is the, the honest and simple answer. I, I think uh, the one thing that is working in our favor is that uh, we have, as you uh, noted earlier, because of our funding around, the people who have invested in us, and the, the channels that we have access to, we are getting a lot of inbound interest in who the, from the people that we want to be part of our organization. Uh, uh, an absolute goal for us is to be one of the top centers of high performance communication engineering capability. We want to attract the people, work with people who are in that space, and be part of that community in multiple different dimensions. So the, the single largest thing that we are doing in that area is making sure that we are present in all of these channels and we are part of the conversation, we are part of anything new and interesting that is being defined and designed and we are offering our own ideas and our own innovation in those, in those specific topics. Um, beyond that, it's all the standard things, uh, recruiting channels, recruiting agencies, people that uh, refer, refer to us by word of mouth, and so on and so forth. Shuji, now your, your passion for sports and the life lessons they offer is fascinating. Um, could you share some of the key lessons from sports that you find innocuous to being the leader of a startup? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a funny question because I, uh, uh, this is actually a pet topic of mine. Um, so, so I watch, play, study a lot of soccer. I actually, uh, uh, Johan Cruyff is one of my absolute favorite uh, soccer players over the years uh, and, and managers and so on and so forth. He has, uh, in my office, I have quotes from him uh, hung on the walls. And uh, it turns out, right, uh, soccer is a very interesting sport to study because like a startup, you start and finish with most of the team as it is. You don't replace players. There is no specialists that come and go. You don't have quick turns. You don't bench half your team uh, because they're tired. Um, you start with a set of people and you finish with almost all the same people. Maybe a few changes here and there along the way. Um, and you also learn, like we were talking about earlier, that there are virtuosos, there are people who are amazing, and you have to give them space to express themselves. And there are people who keep the engine going, right? The people who just work hard, glue things together, clean up the messes, and, and operate well as a team. And uh, if you see, again, like I was saying earlier, if you look at the more successful franchises, they are the ones who manage to do that well. You, Assemble a team to a vision, fill the people, and then give each of the individuals 
reasonable freedom to express themselves within the, the framework of how the team should operate. Um, to me, I think it's, it's actually a fascinating uh, study to see how well-managed teams, and whether it's sports or uh, a technology company, have almost the same attributes and characteristics. I also, uh, I also practice, actually I teach karate as well. Uh, and the thing I've learned from that is, you know, it really is all about the mind. For almost everything, if you can think it, you can likely achieve it. The question is, do you really, really want to? Because if you do get the right mindset and be willing to get beaten up on the way to learning something, as long as those two things are true, you will get there and you will get there eventually. So I do have to ask you, how do you uncover in an interview that strong want, that, 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 that somebody's going to have a strong enough want? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question, actually. So my, my interview style is um, to not ask too many questions. What I have found is uh, if you really want to understand a person and you want to understand what makes them tick and whether what makes them tick is what you want in your organization. Um, the best way to do it, in my experience, is to ask a very simple, high-level question which, which requires a long, complicated, and thoughtful answer. Mm and let them answer it. Because uh, they are more likely to construct the narrative that reveals who they are hmm. than you are if you try to construct it for them. Shujit, you've been incredibly gracious with your time and, uh, and knowledge, and so much appreciated. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, whether it's for inquiries about sales, partnerships, potential employment, or anything else, how can they? How, how would you like for them to go about getting a hold of you? So I'm uh, obviously you can be I am Shujit Mukherjee at LinkedIn. You can find me there, or Shujit at Enfabrica.net, which is my email address and my preferred mode of communication, would be the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, and I would love to hear from people. Uh, whether it's for sales, partnership, or anything else. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for your time and look forward to speaking again very soon. It was my pleasure entirely, Justin, and I'm hoping we'll speak again soon. <laughs>